Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to the audience, the scholars, and the friends all over the world. And welcome to the System Analytics Global uh, Leader Seminar Series. And today we're very honored to have Professor Jin Jun Shi from Georgia Tech uh, to give us a seminar on machine learning enabled quality improvement uh, in smart manufacturing systems. Well, actually, indeed, when I was in US and I attend the seminars where Professor Shi he is the speaker, you will know, notice that the majority of the hosts, they will start with, although everyone here knows Professor Shi, I will still introduce him. So gradually you'll find that this becomes the commonly used the first sentence when introducing Professor Shi. Okay. So today I will also start with this. And actually indeed, today is like we have IE society members gathering together and actually there's really no need to introduce Professor Shi, but I, I will still do that. Uh, so for, uh, Professor Shi is the current Stillwood uh, Chair and a Professor uh, in Milton Stillwood Schools uh, of ISE uh, from Georgia Tech. And he's a pioneer in developing and applying uh, data fusion enabled uh, quality improvement. And by fusion engineering models and data science models, uh, he developed uh, efficient methodologies uh, for integrating like system informatics uh, statistics and control theory uh, for designing and improving the performance of a wide range of production systems like uh, manufacturing or multi-stage manufacturing systems and service systems. Uh, of course, his research has been uh, has generated a huge amount of excellent top publications, but it's more important that uh, his research uh, has been implemented in various production systems. So as I know, his variation reduction techniques have been uh, implemented or employed by more than 20 plants, I think, uh, in automotive industry. And also his data fusion techniques or methods have been implemented in more than 40 or around 50 industrial corporations. Uh, of course, his, also, uh, his research also has been funded by uh, NSF, uh, NSF uh, the Department of Energy, the GM, uh, the Ford, Boeing, uh, Lockheed Martin, and also uh, uh, Pizza, and also the and, and NIST Advanced Technology Program, and Honeywell and Samsung, uh, uh, all those famous companies uh, all over the world. So Professor Xi is also the founding chair of QSR subdivision that informs the quality statistic, quality statistics and reliability. And he has served and is currently serving as the EIC of several top uh, IIC journals like IIC transactions. Uh, he was also elected as a member of NAE, the National Academy of Engineering of the US for his significant contribution in developing data fusion based quality methods and implementing um, the methods in multi-stage manufacturing systems. Uh, he's the fellow of ISE, he's the fellow of ASME and a fellow of INFORMS, and he's also the recipient of many, many outstanding medals and awards uh, like ASQ Walter Schuhart uh, Medal, uh, the ASQ Brombar Award, uh, uh, also, RSE David Baker Distinguished Research Award and uh, the RIE Albert Horseman Distinguished Educator Award, and many words. Uh, I do not list all of them here. And apart from uh, achievements made by him own, actually, Professor Shi is also an excellent academic supervisor. So, in the US, we call them the family of Shi, actually. So, he has produced around uh, 40 PhD students, I think, and where nearly 30 of them has joined top IE departments all around the world in the US, in Hong Kong, and in mainland China. So like Professor Fu Titong from uh, uh, UST, uh, Professor Judy Jing uh, from uh, Michigan Annabelle, and Professor Shi Yuzhou from Wisconsin Madison, right? uh, and Professor Yu Ding from Tax AM, uh, Professor Chang Huang from USC uh, and Professor Yong Chen from University of Iowa, uh, Professor Jing Li, I think she currently uh, she just moved to Georgia Tech, right? 
Yeah. And also Jian Liu, Professor Jian Liu from University of Arizona, and also Professor Yuan Jing and Xiao Wei from Virginia Tech, and also Kai Bo Liu from Wisconsin Medicine as well. So I think you'll still have little academic sons and daughters and your grandchildren, they are now rising stars all around the world. So, so before I pass time to Professor Shi, actually I also would like to welcome two distinguished guests from our local universities. Uh, and actually they are also global leaders in the QSR sectors. Uh, so Professor uh, Song from UST, Professor, you wanna say hello to the audience? Yeah. And also Professor Ming Xie from CTU. Okay. So thank you. And thank you for to, to join us to welcome Professor Xi. Okay. So Professor Xi's talk will last for roughly one hour. And after that, we will have the QA session. So you can during the talk, you can leave your questions in the QA session in the QA box. And uh, Professor Xi will discuss with us after his talk. So um, I think it's, it's it's time to pass the time to Professor Xi. Okay, so Professor Xi, you can feel free to start uh, when you feel comfortable. Yeah, please. Okay, you can hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first, uh, thanks uh, Professor Zheng and the Hong Kong University invited me to uh, give the seminar and also very considering uh, put the seminar in the night of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so some uh, audience from other regions, uh, Europe or US can also participate in the seminar. Uh, so when I prepare my seminar talk, originally titled was the machine learning enabled quality improvements in smart manufacturing. And then when I start to prepare, I found out the topic is a little bit too big, too broad. So I want to narrow down a little bit. I put one word in process. So machine learning enabled in process quality improvements in smart manufacturing. So this can narrow down the topic a little bit. And also I take this opportunity to uh, reintroduce this in process quality improvement concept. So in this talk, I will first give an introduction, talk about my understanding of uh, smart manufacturing and then talk about what in process called improvements. And uh, then uh, discuss some general framework for uh, machine learning enabled uh, in process called improvements. Basically saying uh, this uh, second section is part of my uh, uh, class, System Informatics, uh, PhD level in uh, Georgia Tech. It's talking about when you get a new project on manufacturing, what should you do? How many factors you should consider? What's a systematic way to uh, leading to a research uh, topic or solve the problem? And then I gave a few examples uh, on uh, machine learning enabled uh, IPQI. Uh, depending on time, uh, I finish most of them, probably have more example than one hour I can talk about and finally give a summary. So what is the smart manufacturing? So I could have a different definitions. Uh, but in my opinion, smart manufacturing is a combination of major innovations in information and the digital technologies. So it covers different aspects in smart manufacturing. Like uh, first we have lots of sensors and uh, through IoT to connect everything, machine, machine to machine, robotics, uh, order of the demand and so on. And then it generates big data from sensing and IoT and all interconnected. And then shared through cloud and cloud computing and then through artificial intelligence, machine learning and so on to do the data fusion, data analytics. When I say data fusion, I mean not just the sensing data, but the design information, product design, process design, and also heterogeneous data from different aspects of the manufacturing process and the jointly to do the data analysis. And we need effective algorithm to, to conduct data analysis in parallel or in uh, separate locations, but in a coordinated way and virtualize to the user. So in a way, the user can understand and comprehend the sophisticated data analysis, but the visualization should be simple and straightforward. And we need definitely robotics automation to make smart manufacturing 
indeed deliver something, fabricate something. And one critical problem more important than before is uh, cybersecurity for uh, smart manufacturing in all dimensions. Could be the design information, process information, intrusion, some intrusion to uh, make trouble to the machine, robots, to the specifications, so the deliver parts not meet the requirements and so on. And everything I said about right now, finally need to go to uh, advanced manufacturing system. So that is, uh, in my view, different key components of uh, smart manufacturing. So in a broad sense, we say the smart manufacturing is a collision of new technologies that enable new manufacturing capabilities to achieve higher quality, high productivity, high flexibility, and with reduced cost. So those are the ultimate objectives. No matter what called the smart manufacturing, intelligent manufacturing, we want high quality, productivity, flexibility, and the reduced cost. If any one of them not satisfied, that kind of system will not desirable. I see here the top, how to make this one disappear? Oh, maybe, okay. Any suggestions? How can I make this disappear? Because you cannot see the title. Oh, oh, I know. If I don't touch it, probably it's disappear, right? Um, so there are some uh, success stories of uh, smart manufacturing. So German uh, used smart manufacturing, achieved 99.99% uh, product quality. Boeing has a uh, smart manufacturing increased productivity by 50%. And uh, GE tried to uh, improve supply chain with smart manufacturing concept, uh, get efficiency improved by 20%. And also ABB improved the assembly time, reduced the time by 10%. So for all those uh, stories, the focus of smart ma manufacturing among all those uh, success, uh, successful stories is bringing the elements of uh, smart technology, such as uh, sensing inputs, computer po computing power, always connectivity, artificial intelligence, and advanced data analytics to the traditional production system. So traditional advanced manufacturing systems add with those uh, smart technologies, that is uh, smart manufacturing. And the, the key components of uh, smart manufacturing, I say, is uh, system data analytics. And in manufacturing, different from other data analytics, we should really focus on integrate engineering domain knowledge, product design, process design, engineering aspects, with advanced data analytics, that will enable smart manufacturing effectively. So talk about what are the system data analytics aspects. We can see from here, uh, we should focus on product improvements, manufacturing process improvements, real-time forecasting, interconnect system for everything, data fusion, machine learning for heterogeneous data, monitoring anomaly detection, root cause diagnosis, prognostics, and predict maintenance and control. And also again, cyber security. So you can see everything is interconnected through our inter, uh, internet. And then we have different components, automation, robotics, motion control, and uh, so on. For, uh, to deliver the manufacturing system. So there are different aspects of system data analytics. Uh, this talk, we more focus on in-process code improvements. So what is the in-process code improvements? Uh, this is the terminology I introduced in uh, 1995 when I first interviewed in, uh, for faculty foundation in uh, industrial and operations engineering in uh, at UM, Michigan. Uh, in that time, I, I think that some of you know my own training. I got my bachelor, master, 
almost PhD in Department of, of Automatic Control Automation. And then I got my PhD in Michigan in uh, mechanical engineering manufacturing. So in that time, I almost know nothing about industrial engineering. And then I got invited for interview. I just think about what I can do in IE. And uh, by using my background, and also there is indeed need important aspects in industrial engineering. So to prepare my interview, I come up with words in process called improvements. And this is how I, and the next year, I write uh, for this concept, I write a proposal, I get an NSF career award, also named as in process called improvements. So when I prepare the interview, I try to understand different aspects of uh, quality control, quality management, quality improvements. So you can see this one is uh, a simple flow of manufacturing system. Start from uh, product, the need of the product, and then design the product, design the process. And then manufacturing fabrication, we get the product uh, inspection and then we ship to the cu customer. So along the production, I mean the, the manufacturing system, we have different uh, quality methodologies for quality improvements. So in product process design, we have a Takuti method focused on design experiments. Basically the concept is how to design the product, design the process, which is robust to disturbance in manufacturing. So that's a concept. And another concept is a statistical quality control or statistical process control technique. How to do sampling, how to manage the product, quality characteristics, and then to see the process in control, out of control. And this one focus on the manufacturing product. And also, so that means uh, quality control philosophy, total quality management, which is important for all aspects of manufacturing, design, manufacturing, the product management, but more focus on quality management. I say among all these paradigm, right now we talk about 1995, one thing is missing is what's happening in the manufacturing process. Because uh, the disturbance happens in manufacturing, what kind of disturbance cannot anticipate it in design experiments, in the design stage. You cannot cover every, everything. Something still happens. And also when you do the quality inspection, quality, uh, quality inspection and in control of control, if out of control, the defects are already there. And also when we find the defects, what is really happening in the manufacturing process? What are the root cause? What can I do to improve the quality? That's a little bit too late for in this stage. And also quality management, ask people follow different rules, different policies, ISO 9000, all those kinds of uh, things very important, but still cannot address real time what's happening in manufacturing process. If something happens, how can we find out quickly and uh, address the problem? So I say within the process, how to do quality improvements is IPQI, in process quality improvements, really emphasize real time defect prevention during the stage of manufacturing. So this concept of IPQI. So compare with uh, IPQI and uh, SQC, what are the difference? So again, this is a manufacturing process we see in the last slides. SQC or SPC try to focus on the product quality characteristics, do uh, accept a sampling or sampling, and then try to see process in control out of control. If something out of control, that one send the alarm and then the operator, the engineers, we will try to do some intervention, try to figure out what's wrong and then close the loop to impact on the design and the manufacturing process. So what's IPQI different from here? So IPQI try to not only get the product measurements but also the in-process sensing during the manufacturing and then get the sensing data of the process and the product information to do the data analysis based on product process design information through optimization control theory 
and fusion this, try to automatically find out what are the root cause if something wrong and what are the trend of the process, how to do the compensation control to impact on this. So this one is closed loop for IPQI. And uh, one emphasize I like to say about the sensors. So in manufacturing process, there are many machines. Each machine has lots of sensors. For example, a sampling press, 200 ton, they have the 250 vibration sensors, lots of them. And you may say, there are so many sensors, what they are used for? In manufacturing system, there are lots of sensors actuators that are really used for machine control, automation control. You have motor go to certain speed, you have feedback to make sure the motor gets that kind of speed. You have a furnace to control the temperature to certain time, maintain certain temperature. The sensor and the control will make sure the furnace has that kind of temperature. So the, all the sensing information are available in factory information system. They are 100% recorded currently, and all, even in some time, so lots of data. However, those kind of sensing information used locally for automation machine information, but what the relationship between product quality and those sensing information, that kind of a model, that kind of linkage is uh, not there. The so IPQI in this kind of data analysis and the modeling is try to link the quality product information with manufacturing product information. So if uh, any of you go to a plant, manufacturing plant, you ask them, do you have sensors? I'm sure they said yes. And then you ask them, if the sensing, product sensing information change in certain ways, certain patterns, how your product will react quantitatively, do you know? Most of the time they say no, they, they do not know. So this has a lot of rich information and all this together is a research opportunity and also make impacts in reality, in real manufacturing or smart manufacturing. And why like really talking about this one, even proposed in uh, 1995. In fact, in my 20, close to 30 years uh, uh, experience in industrial engineering, this is kind of my research focus. Start from simple statistical methods, the regression, the genetic regression, uh, wavelets, and so on. And to right now, we have uh, images, functional data, lots of information, much more rich, and also heterogeneous. The machine learning artificial intelligence really can bring a new era of IPQI. So that's why I like to revisit this one and get more people interested, hopefully can make a bigger impact. So we say IPQI emphasize engineering driven modeling and the data analysis to link the process sensing data with the product quality characteristics. And then this uh, in process sensing data can be different types of measurements and different types of sensors. And this leading to uh, new research opportunities. So the so IPQI really try to combine process change detection, isolation, diagnosis, and conversation. So if we compare the IPQI with conventional SPC, we can see these different aspects. First, something in the process, something wrong in the process, process false. Conventional SPC try to do detection in control, auto control. IPQI, not only detection, but also isolation. There are multi-stage manufacturing in which station stage, what particular components give trouble, that's isolation. And then why this give trouble is the root cause diagnosis. So we want to do this in, during the manufacturing. Talking the product defects, SPC emphasize inspection, accept the sampling, uh, sampling strategy and so on. IPQI emphasize prevention. We want to monitor, control the process. So the defects will not occur, finally. And talking how to solve the problem, problem resolution. Conventional SPC rely on offline operator intervention, people, engineers try to figure out what's going on. 
And we like to have a systematic approach, which is uh, engineering-driven data analysis. So we say machine learning enables IPQI to address new challenges in uh, smart manufacturing. So what are new challenges? I mean, opportunity and challenge, I'm really sorry. Uh, the most important title you, can, you cannot see, right? I mean, that's uh, something I should uh, pay attention next time. Make the title lower than this bar. So what new challenges, opportunities uh, for IPQI? We talk the opportunities, we see there are lots of uh, data available right now, much more than before. And also the system operations control actions become more transparent. So you can see from the data, you take action, what happens? You can see it uh, immediately. Somebody try to help. Sorry, I, I cannot see. And also uh, what's opportunity, technology capabilities, flexibilities of individual machine, machines, machine tools become more capable. And more importantly, the advancement of data science, machine learning and the co computing capabilities become much more powerful than before. And then what's challenges? So when we have lots of data and do data analytics, how to define a clear engineering objectives so why we do this is very important. Under this, how to quickly retrieve all relevant information from all stages of manufacturing system. So that's uh, very important. And also uh, how to address data and uncertainties, how to address noise and uh, is uh, very important. And one more thing is uh, what's the noise, what's the uncertainties. For a given objective, I need certain types of data or certain sensing data. So there are some data really meaningful, but not relevant with my objective at this time. That meaningful information to me is noise. And that you already introduce uncertainty. Another thing is uh, the imbalance of data availability. So we always have a massive, normal, good quality oper operational data. And we have a very few specific failure data. And if we talk about specific failure, specific quality issues, it is even less in terms of data. When we have imbalanced data, when we do a lot of research, clustering, modeling, and so on, there are some challenges in our data analysis. And also there's a lack of a unified model strategy to make a real time informative decisions. So how can we get the lot of information and uh, make a decision, I put the quotation here, real, real time, really means depending on the need of the decision, we make a timely decision. And uh, last but not least, how to do deep integration of data science and design manufacturing engineering. This is uh, very important. We have lots of excellent mechanical electrical engineers, understand the design, understand manufacturing, the first principle. We have excellent data scientists understand all the tools to do the data analysis, but how to make them work together and the data fusion, fusion those knowledge together. So that's a rather challenge. So if we talk about the vision, uh, what kind of smart manufacturing and uh, what, how to realize this one. I view the manufacturing system is a manufacturing system network. So you can understand this one, different machines, the parts flow, fabricated parts flow from one to another to another, and finally become final product. You may also understand this machine is a supplier, and then this is a supplier network. So, so this one is a physical network which fabricate the product. At the same time, every machine, every stage, there are lots of sensors, and these sensors, through the linkage of the production process design, production system design, through linkage become a sensor network. So this is a digital sensing network on top of this real physical network. And then we have a product process design information. And during the production, we have uh, operational data. And this uh, fusion, this two knowledge, we can get decision network or uh, smart decision. 
So physical network on top of it has this digital sensing network. And then on top of it has this decision network. The information transfer within a network between different layers of network is uh, something we want to accomplish in smart manufacturing. So the question is uh, how to systematically conduct engineer driven data fusion for cars improvements. So this is uh, the following few slides is a part of my lecture uh, in the PhD level class. So the topic is uh, if you get a new pro project for example, um, by the way, uh, Professor Zheng, I saw there are question and uh, there are chat. I cannot read the question in this uh, share screen mode. If anyone asks question you, you think should interrupt me, you can read the question, I can answer, or we can address questions in the end of my talk. Either way, it's up to you, it's your decision. Yeah, we can leave it at the end, it's up to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. So, okay, thank you. So this is saying, assume there are semiconductor manufacturing, there are hundreds of machines, and uh, they care about uh, the deposition uh, uniformity as a question. The rolling process, there are hundreds of roller stations. You, we want the final quality rolling bar. Surface is perfect. The dimension is perfect. If something wrong, how can we control this uh, dimensional issues? If the machine production system have a system down from time to time. And I want to find out why and improve the efficiency uh, of flow of the manufacturing. So this is a new product, new project. You get assignments. So what should you do? And how can you put hands on this uh, project? So first, you should understand the variables and the properties in the production system. So what is the performance measure? So what, what do you want to improve? I mean, it could be quality, could be productivity, could be cost, okay? And then related, what are the process variables impact on this? What control variables you can change to impact on the process and finally to the product? And what are the noise variables which you cannot anticipate? So understand variables and their properties. And then model the relationship among them. One is a physical driven uh, physical driven model, double E, uh, ME, uh, differential equations, data driven model, machine learning, regression, all those kind of techniques. And in my PhD class, we call the system informatics control, which emphasize integration of physics driven and data driven modeling, you know, system level. So, so, so model the relationship among those variables. And then do the analysis and improve the system through design optimization, monitoring, diagnosis, find the root causes, automatic control, feedback, feed forward to improve the process. And also this is a PDD level class uh, in Georgia Tech. We need to balance what the theory, what's the application. So for application, we want, I mean, for all this one, we want here. We want as simple as possible, but also identify the gaps. If uh, a student in, uh, in your program can take all the courses, solve these engineering problems, it's not a research problem. It's good, it's excellent. At the same time, you do not need to treat this one as a research topic. But if you want to see, you see the model is not perfect, cannot meet the precision requirements, not effective, that gap is really the opportunity to develop new theory for research. So from next slides, I will talk about each items here uh, of, uh, so first understand system variables. So system performance variables, we say is a measure the overall functionality competitiveness of a system, which can be the cost, the quality, the yield, and so on. And performance measure most of the time is the mean and the variability of this performance. So improve, make the mean on the target, make the variation variability to zero. So that is uh, improve. And then talk the system variables, which uh, is the variables that des describe the system status or system states. So this one 
can be plus variable, can be force, temperature, vibration, uh, speed, and so on. So those are the plus variables. And often those uh, plus variables related to one or more cis performance variables. So if plus variables have nothing to do with uh, season performance, that cannot be, cannot happen. And also system control variables, the variables that alter the system status and system performance. And also understand the control action has to be done offline, like run to run before run the production or online. So during the fabrication, real time, you can make adjustment. So understand what variables, what are they, what kind of frequency or constraints for these uh, control variables. Another important thing is to understand noise variables. So variables that vary randomly and impact on system status and performance. So for these noise variables, also we should further classify them as observable noise variables or unobservable noise variables. Observed variables is something we cannot, we, we cannot control it, but we can measure it like my basement what is a uh, moisture, uh, what is a temperature. In certain way I can control, but uh, such I can observe. Something unobserved noise uh, variables, like the dust in my basement. I don't know how to measure, maybe it can be measured, but not in my home. So that's also different strategies to deal with observable or unobservable noise in our data analytics. So understand system variables is a very important. You have a system, you have system layout, and then for the layout, you put all the sensors, all the variables in each station, each stage, and uh, characterize them, this one. So this is a very first important, a very important uh, step. The next one is understand data characteristics. And uh, you know, I don't know what I, I'm writing here. So, <clears throat> understand data characteristics. So what's the data type? So we have continuous variable, discrete variable, text data, functional curves, image videos. So these are different data types. The data is a stationary or non-stationary data. When we do the sensing is a uniform sampling, non-uniform sampling and uh, mixed uh, strategy. So to understand the data, very important. And also how to collect the data. For some device, some small system, maybe we can do design experiments. So that's probably the best way to get high quality data at the same time, so that's high cost. And many times impossible to, de to do design experiments like semiconductor plant, like a uh, rolling plant, steel mill. I don't think people ask, uh, allow us to do design experiments. Another type of data is uh, observational data during system uh, natural operation, normal operation. So in other words, during the system operations, we can have tons of observational data. Most of them are good data, normal production, occasionally have some uh, failure, machine failure, system false data. And uh, also for the data collection can be online, can be offline measurements for those data. I like to say, if you develop a methodology, based on observational data and effectively address the problem you care about, that would be the best one. And in fact, there are more and more research focused on observational data, uh, data analytics. And then right now we have the data we uh, already and we think about how to get a model. So we need to see what kind of uh, model types are effective for the performance and the process variable linkage. So we can, there are many possibilities, regression, time series, queuing, petri net, state space, uh, linear mix model, and uh, so on, tensor and tensor regression. So one suggestion is always try with a simple model. If simple model is sufficient, do not try to go more complex ones. And uh, another thing is that it's a tensor and tensor, uh, tensor stuff, because the more and more data become high dimensional, functional curves, multivariate functional curves, image, video. So understand the tensor techniques would be uh, nice, I want to say, in my opinion, frontiers in this uh, quality uh, data analytics. 
So right now we have a data, we have a model, and then how to do system analysis, monitoring, diagnosis, and control. So by using this model, what we like to do, one is uh, system analysis, basically saying, try to identify the relationship among different variables, the sensitivity, stability of the system, the tolerance, sentences for different parameters of the process variable. In other words, within this tolerance for the process variables, the product will guarantee uh, meet the specifications. Design optimization. So these are different aspects of system analysis. And we may also do uh, monitoring diagnosis, prognostics, basically anomaly detection, and try to find the root causes of uh, specific failures sorry, performance failure. And the residual life uh, estimation for prognostics. And the last one is uh, system maintenance uh, control and uh, improvements. So maintenance may do reactive, reliability-centered, condition-based predictive maintenance or proactive. So consider the cost of maintenance, machine downtime, all different aspects, how to do maintenance. So top of the control, we can do certain equivalence control Cautious control means uh, how to consider uncertainty of estimation to do the control. Probing control means uh, how can we design control strategy, make the future estimation more reliable, less variability, and the optimal control. So different. And the supervised adaptive control uh, could be also uh, important. Basically, we have a real-time control loop. And on top of it, we have algorithms to evaluate the model uh, uncertainty evaluate the updates, the model, and uh, address different uh, uh, disturbance, unexpected, or system structure change. So this uh, supervisory adaptive control. So this is how we use the model to do different things. And we say, right now, I go back to say, once we have new projects, new process we are working on, how to do information gathering. So. We should understand the system. We have the layout, we have the variables, we have everything marked. And then we know what we care about is what types of quality issues specifically. And then based on the system layout and the key stages, key procedures of the system, you can think about this like a network with different nodes. And then we see what are the process sensing information, what type of them, where's the location, What's the data structure? Where to keep it? So we do this mapping. You can see this, uh, this loop many, many times to truly understand process sensing, system layout, where they are, and so on. So this one. After I get this one, I should do another mapping. I have a performance. I have process sensing information. I will do multiple mapping iteration to truly understand the potential. Right now, I'm not talking about quantitative uh, modeling. I'm more talking about the engineering understanding from the product process design to do the mapping. And after we have this uh, done, we can do a data analysis and uh, modeling. So this kind of a pro pro process is very important for reality. <clears throat> and then how to do the data analysis? Right now we have system performance and the process data. So we have this data we we'll try to study what are data types, what are the trends, what are the correlation, what are the characteristics, maybe do some uh, clustering and so on, so this one. And then we do the feature extraction and then try to interpret if there are some physical interpretations of the feature. And then we do the classification, clustering, try to group them together and, and see what kind of clusters. And then we do the iteration, multiple iterations of this. When we do clustering, there are two types of clusters. I mean, sorry. Two ways. One is based on statistics. We all learn something, how to do the clustering. After you do the clustering, this is a process sensing variable, you map to the production system. And after you map to the product system, you will find out from the engineering point of view, some additional data may be in the cluster. Some additional, uh, some sensing data in the cluster should not be there because of engineering reasons. And then that I'm talking the mapping, redo. And finally, uh, we do what kind of a model type we would like to use. 
and we do the modeling. So this is uh, how we do this one. So after we get the model already, how to do system analysis. So we do the system analysis, we can say optimization, monitoring diagnosis, prognostics, maintenance control. Those are the different things. Maybe one, only one, maybe two applicable to your problem, to your project. So when we're doing this one, we should always consider two aspects, which also make our research uh, have a little higher quality or more attractive, is considering data uncertainty, considering risk assessment of your analysis result, and also considering implementation, implementation constraints. So for, uh, for example, uh, in the rolling process, there are multiple variables you are able to adjust. However, some of them can adjust just by uh, like uh, in seconds, you change the parameter setting and then the automation automatically take care. Some other adjustment need to physically go there, uh, uninstall the machine, make adjustment, put it back. So this one also gave us challenge when we do all those kind of things. When we consider it's a challenge, the problem solving may not be straightforward and then start leading to new research opportunities. Like I said, for the IPQI or data analysis, there are lots of conventional techniques. People have been using this one and very effective. And uh, right now we say, what machine learning techniques can be used to address all those problems I just talked about. So this is something I'm going to talk in the next phase of uh, seminar. Oh, only 10 minutes <laughs> left. Uh, okay. This is our recent papers uh, related with uh, data enabled uh, IPQI. And I asked my students uh, uh, get the reason I would say other than one paper is the 2007. All other papers are published uh, after 2018. So relatively new uh, papers. And then I asked them saying, okay, for each paper, what kind of machine learning techniques uh, we used and we did uh, subspace learning, uh, active learning to, uh, uh, to get a better model and uh, uh, metrics, uh, tensor decomposition, tensor regression, to handle functional data, images, and so on. Based network, this was the old one. Uh, uh, machine learning with the sparsity on monitoring, control, diagnosis, different papers, uh, deep learning, multitask learning, and so on. So basically, I, I like to say, you can see there are two clusters. One is a tensor decomposition and regression. There are quite a few papers. That reflect the new challenges of sensing multifunctional data, high dimensional image, video signals, how to deal with them. So input and the input plus variable are functional uh, data images. The so quality measure are functional or images. In this kind of situation, how can we find out which process sensing data, functional image, impact on the quality uh, response, which is a functional or image? So this is uh, something addressed here. I know Mustafa, uh, he will give a seminar in uh, IICE, QC, quality engineering, reliability engineering uh, subdivision webinar. Hope you guys, uh, I mean, he, he will talk about some of this paper. In the following slides, I talk more about the, with the sparsity and uh, sparse learning examples. Okay, so those are the, uh, techniques or papers we recently published. I also uh, asked students get this list of algorithms used in those uh, papers uh, in machine learning. So basically have uh, two major categories, large scale optimization algorithm for machine learning, first order methods, you can see a uh, uh, grand and decent uh, momentum uh, proximal methods, uh, ADMM uh, and so on, second order, coordinate decent, block decent uh, algorithm, uh, based learning uh, for machine learning. 
for a sampling-based method and the optimization-based approach. So those, in all those publications here, those are the key algorithms. So if anyone want to, I mean, you will come to read the paper. By the way, all those papers you can see there the underline. Uh, you can uh, get them from my website. You go to Jian Junxi website publications, and you can double click. You can get a PDF file. <clears throat> so one thing I like to say is uh, Dr. Hao Yan and Dr. Andy Wang, uh, they developed a unique module to cover all those aspects, including a high dimensional heterogeneous data modeling, large scale optimization, polar computation, and hands on software with the real data to, uh, to teach those kind of stuff. All my other students uh, really benefit from them. Um, they are expert. Hao Yan was a student and currently a assistant professor in Arizona State University. Lucky, I mean, he, when he was a student, he developed a module and teach in my uh, PhD level class on those modules. Uh, in that time, the student registration only 17, but uh, the people sit in close to 40, including people from OR, uh, statistics, and so on. Uh, right after Hao Yan graduated, Dr. Andy Wang joined our group and uh, adopt this one to further expand the curriculum. And these, those modules can really make uh, one class to teach non-machine learning students to do machine learning work with high quality. So uh, I really appreciate this too. And all, uh, all my students, including other students in SYE uh, related, uh, they, they learn this material. And Hao uh, Yan is in Arizona State, Andy Wang right now in job market. So whoever want to can go after him and uh, <laughs> get the benefits, definitely can put your, your, the research into another level uh, by taking learning this. Uh, Okay, so with uh, eight minutes, I talk about this uh, six topics, which is uh, impossible. So I, I selected those uh, topics, uh, want to introduce, want to say uh, one thing. Those are the real problems in uh, engineering and the real problem in uh, manufacturing. And without machine learning as a tool, as a technique, this, uh, those problems cannot be solved. At least we tried different methods. We cannot solve those problems. And finally, we borrow some machine learning techniques to address these uh, problems. And I just talked about the problem formulation, what problem, what problem formulation. If you want to say how to solve the problem, you can read the papers. Um, so the first topic is uh, work with an uh, airplane company on the fuselage assembly. So the fuselage, you can see uh, this airplane, the body of the airplane cut different segments become different cylinders. Each cylinder is a fuselage. So this is one fuselage. The problem in the fuselage assembly is uh, when you put the two segments, two cylinders together, there is a gap on the edge, they are not perfect aligned. When this is not perfect aligned, you cannot put them together, I mean, assemble them together. And uh, the way a company currently doing is, uh, you can see here, this one has a small fixtures. They use these fixtures to push and pull this one to change the shape of this cylinder. For another cylinder, they have the similar setup, they push and the pull, and hopefully they align and then join them together. So of course, right now they use uh, people, um, experienced people to push and the pull. This, which is the low efficiency, take longer time, not optimal, it works, may not be the best. And also depend on who is working on this one, take a longer time or shorter time. So we work on this project, basically propose, we say smart manufacturing, right? So we have two, Fuselage coming in, we use a 3D laser to measure the position of each gap, the each edge of the cylinder. And then we do a modeling, do a model, and based on the model, we find the optimal 
force to push and pull this one. And then we do a verification, verification and this is done automatically. And these uh, small numbers are the measurement points. This uh, error are the potential actuators to push and pull this uh, cylinder. So this is our strategy. In order to do this, uh, we need the control strategy and we need the platform to develop control strategy. So that's why we here I introduced two aspects. One is uh, sparse learning for model calibration and the sparse learning for fuselage shape control. So here are the uh, papers. <clears throat> so first we developed the IPA model based on the input from uh, the company, all the parameters are real and the process, uh, the real uh, description, we get this model and then we want to say, use this model, which is the FEA model to uh, mimic the properties of the real fuel sludge. So the question is, is that really true? They are the same. The company did a test. So they set up the real fuel sludge here and uh, they set up, they use a uh, jack to push and pull here. You measure this uh, deformation on this point. In our simulation, we do exactly the same setup and measure this one. We hope the measurement will be the same, this uh, picture. And uh, here is, uh, you can see this uh, result. Uh, I forgot which is which. Uh, blue line is the uh, FEA model, red line are the experimental data. You can see even the force smaller, the model is okay. When force is larger, there are large deviation here. So that means some parameters in the model is not accurate. And then we need to do the parameter estimation. However, we have really challenge in the parameter estimation because uh, the company only provided eight fuselage experimental data and we have more parameters to be calibrated. So how to address this uh, problem? Uh, we, I mean, the team spent a lot of time and finally uh, they propose this uh, a concept as a sensible variables, sensible variables. And uh, basically we say in this FEA model, if you look at my photo, there are, there are three, uh, three types of variables. One variable, okay, just say one variable is, uh, this variable is uh, pretty accurate because uh, from the engineering design, we can measure it, we can get the true information and then put into the FEA model. This is the accurate parameter. Another parameter it have nothing to do with the performance measure we care about. So this parameter, no matter what, we do not need to calibrate. And the third uh, parameter we call the sensible variable. Such so a variable, very important for the problem, but uh, not accurate. So the question is how to find the sensible variable and what are the value of the sensible variable. So this is uh, the challenge. And in order to do this one, uh, they formalize this uh, optimization. Uh, uh, Dr. Wang, Xiao Wei Yue, Tori, they did the work. <clears throat> so basically formalize, this one is a physical model, is a real experimental. This one is the FEA output. The deformation, these two, and uh, these are the variables to be calibrated. This one is the true value uh, from the design. So by solving this optimization problem, this data here, this will get the sensible variables, which is important to the performance, like get this too closer, but uh, not accurate. Why this works intuitively. So if the parameter to be estimated very close to the true value, like I said, first one, we know this. So this value is almost zero. I mean, this uh, difference is almost zero. So this is not dominant in this uh, term. If uh, this variable have nothing to do with performance, so this variable can be any value and not change this optimization index. Only variable important, sensible, but not accurate. And then this one will be important solve this optimization, we can get the parameters. So this is the idea, which also gets best paper award in uh, 
QSR. Uh, so after calibration, you can see this is uh, pretty much consistent. So this thing, uh, by using this uh, learning techniques, we find this uh, sensible variable. So another task is uh, optimal shape control for this. So right now we have the model. We have the model. We want to see what kind of force apply here to get the best control performance. Uh, Xiao Wei Yue is the first person working on this one. And he used equal distance, equal distance, just like here right now, equal distance here, actuator, and develop a model and then try to minimize the difference between the real incoming fuel sludge with the bad dimensions and through control to the target dimension. So this uh, work published uh, here. And after we present this work to, uh, to the company, the company pretty happy, okay. Before they use the people, right now they have algorithm to find out what's the best force. And then later on, after the discussion with them, they say the fuel sludge is really not a perfect circle. It's an arbitrary shape. I mean, it looks like a circle, but uh, you can see it get in and out like this. So if this one not perfect, we use equal distance actuator may not be the best strategy for any individual fuel sludge control. So they ask us, can we get a strategy for any arbitrary fuel sludge, find the best position of the actuator? And if so, we can probably use less actuator and use less force to deform the parts and make the parts assembly better. Because in air, air plant assembly, any force applied generates generate some potential damage for the fuel sludge. So we propose uh, sparse learning to find actuator positions and control strategy. Juan Du is uh, the person work with Xiao Wei get this done. And currently Juan Du in uh, Hong Kong UST Guangzhou uh, campus. <clears throat> so how, how to do this uh, sparse learning to do this? First develop a model. So, for this uh, incoming fuel sludge, we have the initial shape. And then for this uh, fuel sludge, the properties has a model U and what kind of force apply to change that the deformation which compensate the incoming error. So this is a control strategy. We want this one to be zero. So that means uh, there's no, uh, no gap. I mean, no deviation from the target to find the force. And also this actuator force, this deviation from target. And also we have a number of uh, limited number of uh, actuators. And uh, here the force within a range to make sure not big damage for this uh, part. So in this formulation, this U and F is especially F is a big vector. Use in other words, this force, force is a big vector, has all potential positions on the fuel sludge. And then when we solve this optimization problem with a limited uh, number of actuators, only limited of F non-zero. And uh, when this non-zero, that uh, non-zero one reflected where they are, which is the position, and also what the value of F reflect the force applied to this one. And to solve this problem, Juan formulate, Juan do formulate this one as a optimization uh, sparse learning problem. Basically, this is the original uh, object function and this one was constrained. Uh, limited number of a few uh, actuators. So by solving this optimization problem and also uh, Juan do showed this optimization problem and, and the original one are equivalent. So after solve this one by using like a 20 fuel sludge as a example, uh, um, 20 fuel sludge with 30 uh, uh, fixed actuator positions, they uh, do optimization. So this you can see, the shadow here means uh, deformation. 
the right color means actuator position. And then the result shows the right line here, right dot, has an optimization result by using this uh, sparse learning. For each vertical uh, line here is different potential uh, actuator position for the same fuel sludge. So basically you can see for the maximum deviation after control, the sparse learning provide the best position, lower is better. And the force applied to the fuel sludge, lower is better. And this one has a lower force for these 20 different fuel sludges. This is one example to say, uh, sparse learning get this value for deviation and force. The current practice get this deviation and force. So basically we can use less, less forces to get a smaller shape deviation. And I want to say for this particular, uh, particular problem, for incoming fuel sludge with arbitrary shape, how to deal with it. Uh, we talked with uh, composite guys, we talked with the uh, expert in uh, uh, modeling uh, from ME, uh, material science. We cannot make this happen. We also tried this uh, surrogate model, uh, which is not effective, but this uh, sparse learning solves the problem uh, nicely. Oh. Professor Zheng, uh, it's one hour already. It's fine, you can move on, yeah, please. Uh, sure? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. I worry about the other people getting to, to <laughs> sleep. <laughs> okay, so that was one uh, case study here. I say uh, another problem, uh, subsidized learning, and this work was done by uh, Zhang Chen, Zhang Chen currently Tsinghua University, uh, assistant professor, and uh, Yang Hao, uh, Arizona State University. And also, I think this got best, yeah, best paper award also. <clears throat> so what is the problem to do this? The problem is uh, in the semiconductor uh, manufacturing, the, for each chamber, they have a 130 sensors. And each sensor generates a functional curve like this. These are the, some examples. And uh, this curve means, uh, wafer put into the chamber at the starting point, and then they do different layer uh, deposition, and then take this uh, wafer out from the chamber. So this is uh, one cycle of this. And uh, before work with us, uh, the company had a monitoring strategy for each one. So for each curve, they had a plus minus the three sigma. And then if uh, this goes out of the boundary of the curve, they give one score bad, one score. And they have 130 sensors. They say how many scores bad. After beyond a certain score, they say this uh, quality has concern on this paper. So that's how they do it. But clearly, 130 sensors, they have different clusters. That means they are intercorrelated, some of them. And by using multivariate modeling and monitoring, will be more effective than single one. I think everybody agree with this. However, if we use a multivariate monitoring, we need to know which sensor belongs to the same cluster. And uh, based on this, we can do, if we don't know which cluster on the same cluster, which sensors on the same cluster, we cannot use a uh, multivariate. If we have a wrong classification, that's an even more disaster. However, finding this, uh, which sensor belongs to the same cluster is a challenge. The reason is uh, in one cycle, they have different deposition and uh, they start a job, finish a job. And also they have a feedback control within this uh, cycle. Use another words, when this uh, first step finish is a time varying depending on the particular wafer. Could be last longer, could be last smaller. The next segments also longer, smaller. Use another words, you don't know when this uh, one functional curve, where is the boundary of this? If you don't know the boundary, we don't know when this cycle, I mean, step, start or finish, we cannot group them as the multivariate. So in fact, this multivariate monitoring problem had been investigated by uh, several uh, major semiconductor companies. I should say all major, I don't want to, want to mention names. You guys are recording. So uh, uh, they cannot solve the problem. Uh, multivariate effectively. So what we, the company approached us 
to say, uh, you guys are uh, doing data fusion, can you do something with it? In the beginning, we tried different methods, uh, still not very effective. And uh, Chen Zhang Hao Yan come up, a good idea how to do this. So this is uh, uh, what problem we try to study is automatic segmentation on automatic clustering. So basically we have lots of data coming in just like here as an example. We have uh, eight functional curves. However, in reality, they have different segments like this. Segments here, but we do not know where is it, these segments. And also within segments, we have different clusters, segment one, segment two, segment three. So they have different clusters. So if we can do this automatically, we can do feature extraction for each cluster and then monitoring for each cluster. But how to address these two issues? That's a challenge. So the basic concept of uh, this method is for the self expression or uh, self regression. So in this one, they assume each curve, I mean, each one for this the P come from the different subspace. And uh, each subspace have the same basis functions for this, uh, uh, for this uh, curve. And then they do a self regression. So if you look my, look my hands, look my hands here, I have a five functional curves. What the self regression means? Uh, right now I tell you these three belong to the same cluster. These two belong to another cluster, I tell you, but uh, when I get it, I don't know. So I have five curves. I use this uh, curve as response, regression on these four curves, response, regression. So I told you early, these three become the uh, reality the same cluster. So when I do the regression, this is response. The coefficients on these two will be larger. These two will be small or zero. So if I use this one. So right now, if I use this one as a response, use other four as a regression on other four. So you can see the coefficients of these two will be large. These two will be zero. If I use this one as a response, regression on other four, this one will be large. They are, they are in the same cluster. These three will be small. So in other words, I do a self expression for each of them. I will get like the y1, I get these coefficients for other function. y2, uh, I, the second curve, regression others, I get this one. So after I get this uh, large non-zero coefficients, I do a clustering here. So this become different uh, cluster. So this, I did segmentation, basically the cl clustering of the, uh, I mean, clustering of uh, these uh, different curves. So this is, uh, I mean, in the papers, there are more discussion on uh, algorithms, how to solve it. And uh, this is one part, class, uh, automatic clustering, but not segmentation. In segmentation, we assume the coefficients is a time varying, is changing. And also we say it cannot change too fast. We have a penalty here. So solve this one, we can see in different time, the real system, it's changing over time. And then through this estimation, we can see in time t equal to one, we have this cluster time equal to 32. I mean, basically not change. Uh, 33 to 60 have this uh, cluster, 61 to 120 get another uh, group clusters. So, so far we finished last page, clustering, this page, segmentation. So, uh, Zhang Chen applied this one uh, for this uh, movements, uh, body movements uh, structure, uh, doing two things. One is a uh, bow down, pick up something, and then throw away uh, these movements. And uh, each dot is a sensor. And based on the algorithm, you can see the same color means the same cluster, which reflect truly as of the, our intuition uh, with this. You may say, why use this one, not semiconductor? Because the company does not allow us to publish anything with uh, semiconductor data. Uh, so we find another case study. Uh, 
I quickly say this one and then I will stop. So I'm always top. Uh, this was Andy Wang's uh, uh, work. Uh, it's a holistic modeling analysis for multi stage manufacturing process. Uh, so the problem is also motivated by a semiconductor. So in this semiconductor manufacturing process, there are lots of potential faults. Each fault may happen in one of the uh, stages. And then they have different uh, func uh, response as the image or functional curve as a quality measure of this. So <clears throat> for this kind of process, they have this kind of uh, data characteristics. It's a heterogeneous data, it's a mixed data type, functional curve images, it's cascading effects. Something happened in this stage, so something can impact on downstream or other stages, cascading effects. The sparsity of root cause, this is a manufacturing process. Some potential root cause may occur, but for a given time, only very, very few root cause may occur. Otherwise, some big disaster that the, the plant manager should be fired. So the root cause is the sparsity and the measurement is, uh, uh, has a property of smooth. And also the quality issues, response quality issues, also sparse. So this one is a defined of the problem. And the question is uh, uh, try to accomplish, develop a holistic framework for a multi-state manufacturing process. Try to answer three questions. Which actual root cause occurred in the system? How this root cause affect the quality? And what are the major variation patterns in the quality? So right now I have the measurement data of the quality measurements here. I want to answer these three questions. So this uh, problem set up is multiple potential root causes. We have the measurements from each stage. And uh, here has assumption saying they have this linear uh, representation from the quality response with potential root cause. And uh, formalize optimization problem like this and try to solve what's the B, what's the B0. And uh, by solving this B and B0, we can find what are the actual root causes which corresponding non-zero coefficients in B. How this root cause impact on this uh, quality is the uh, corresponding effect matrix, which is the B, I, J, K. And uh, what are the variation patterns uh, for this, the span of all effect matrix related to this output. So this formulation to this problem is the key to solve it. And for each of this uh, uh, index, what are the physical meaning? The first one here is the magnitude of a prediction error. And second one, third one is a uh, uh, quality measure uh, as a functional curve, this quality measure as images. We have two types of uh, quality sensing data, curve image. And this one do selection of uh, potential root causes. And I mean, this is the specific definition. And this is, uh, we see the number of underlying quality patterns of this one, defined quality patterns. And here also we, we have assumption is, uh, yes, limited quality issues and the pattern is also limited. This is a complete setup and uh, it's a convex formulation, but has lots of parameters to be estimated. And how to do this one is uh, in the paper. I just show the results of this, uh, this uh, algorithm. Uh, ADMM controls the algorithm to solve it. They have some uh, derivations for the algorithm. And this is a simulation study, basically, we say four stage manufacturing, four vectors, potential root causes. Each one is a 20 uh, dimension for each of them, 20 potential root cause. And uh, we say only three or six of this 20 happens uh, on the root cause. And then once this have, uh, happens, this uh, root cause happens at the impact downstream, the impact on this Y. And this is how they impact. Uh, here's the results. 
in this case, three actual root cause, two quality uh, concerns. This is uh, the parameter matrix we generate the data in simulation, the true parameters. This is estimated parameters through solving the optimization problem. And only three root causes, which correspond to U1 to U3, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. And this has the input on the first stage, which impact on all downstream stages. So Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, all have response of uh, this uh, U1. So estimation is uh, pretty accurate. Same thing for U2. This one only impacts on the downstream, this whole stage, three stages. And this is the estimation of this coefficient matrix. True estimated, the next stage, the next stage. So basically by using this uh, method, we can find all the root causes. We can see how this impact on this uh, root cause. And also uh, we can see what the quality uh, patterns. Uh, I think we, I stop here. We can have some discussions. Uh, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that would be very, uh, good. Okay. So I think we have questions from both industry and academia, uh, actually. So I think the first question is from industry. So Yong Li, uh, he didn't mention his affiliation. So he asked about if you can provide any case study on Tesla because their smart manufacturing extends beyond production line. And just on the manufacturer alone, it will be interesting to have productivity power with smart process across manufacturers, such as auto industry for comparison. I think first, uh, I did not work with uh, Tesla, but I do pay attention on uh, Tesla's uh, manufacturing, some of the manufacturing process. Uh, they, they recently have this uh, unibody. Uh, I, I worked with the auto industry for 20 some years. So I'm very familiar with dimensional control variation issues. And that probably is one of major issue for uh, Tesla, uh, the dimensional control variation reduction. Um, so uh, answer this question, no, I don't work with uh, Tesla. I don't have their data, but the way they put a unibody uh, structure rather than multiple parts assembled together really shorten the uh, shorten the assembly line, shorten the stamping process, make the product in one step get underbody, uh, side body, all the structures. So that's very good move, good direction. And I'm 100% sure they have lots of sensors in this uh, one body foaming structure to measure the force, pressure, the gap. Uh, so the, the gap means the alignments upper and the lower die. Uh, I think that they have very good opportunities uh, uh, over there. I don't know how they did it. I mean, how they do the data analysis. Okay. And uh, thank you, Professor Shi. And actually, the second question is from Yongli again. It's about human factors on data collection. So for data collection, so what about human factors? So who is behind the machine at the time? any human factors, even with the most automated production line? So data collection, I mean, most of, uh, most of the data we talk about smart manufacturing, the really automatic data collection, is not the people measure it. And uh, the people measure it, uh, that's off, kind of offline measure, much low throughput. This is something uh, we try to go away from it. Uh, Many companies, sensing companies, uh, IoT companies provide that kind of automatic sensing capability. Uh, we may use uh, people measure, human measured data, but uh, that's not preferred. The massive, I mean, high throughput production. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Xi. And the next question from E and Wei from Hong Kong U. So it's a question about machine learning application on the reliability modeling problems. So the first one is about for the small sample scenarios, 
that may frequently occur when insufficient data is collected. So if as such, so can we still get a convincing result through the machine learning methods? I'm not a reliability guy, so I didn't say, I, I cannot answer this question uh, clearly. But talking about a small sample scenario, and uh, one thing uh, I involved is uh, try to get some uh, engineering, I say engineering model, engineering data aspects, and uh, try to combine the engineering knowledge with the uh, uh, small sample data, which may leading to better result, especially uh, if the small sample data come from uh, field means observational data that only have limited uh, range of uh, data. With uh, engineer domain knowledge, probably a better option. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Xi. And the next question is from Chun Xi Huang from Hong Kong UST uh, GZ. Uh, so thank you for the excellent uh, seminar, Professor Shi. So I have a question. You mentioned that solving the real problem based on the observational data during system operation is the best way, and more and more researchers are focusing on this area. So could you please explain a little bit more about observational data and its advantage? Any simple examples will be highly appreciated. <clears throat> uh, there, there are tons of, uh, tons of examples uh, for this. Um, I didn't talk about this one. So you can see, you can see this uh, in this example uh, is high dimensional measurement data. This one is uh, data from semiconductor and uh, those are the potential faults. This is uh, uh, composite parts and this one is a steel rolling machine and uh, ro ro steel rolling process, uh, online sensing to get this uh, image defects. But the reality is we have tons of those kind of data. They may or may not. Uh, I mean, most of them is clean, don't have the defects. But we don't have time and manpower to label those uh, data. And also, those kind of data, gen I mean, defects cannot be generated by design experiments. All of them, because uh, you cannot create, recreate the same surface conditions by changing the machine condition. And this is really arbitrary. In this situation, how can we do automatic detection of this uh, detection isolation of those uh, defects? This is something uh, very important. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the next question is from Roham Tabar from uh, Chalmers uh, in Sweden. So he asked about, when talking about classic in process control, the robust product designs adapted to the fixed manufacturing operations. But recently it has been seen that sensitive designs may provide, for, uh, may provide flexibility for real-time in-process control. So for example, in a smart manufacturing context with adjustable operations. So what's your opinion on this? Uh, so they talking about the robot to the assembly uh... Uh, the robot pro uh, product design, so it's adapted to the fix the manufacturing operation, uh, operation operations in a traditional way. And recently, it has been seen that sensitive designs may provide more flexibility for real time in process control. So, what's your opinion in this? Uh, this this has been done uh, for years. Uh, when I was in Michigan, I worked with uh, TM uh, on a Cadillac. We use what they call C flex. C flex is a robot. Uh, robot can do a five degree of freedom movements. Robot hold a locating pin, like my like my finger holds a cell phone here, and uh, the robot can manipulate in different way and they change orientation. Basically, if the part incoming part is not perfect, this one can make adjustment on the edge with another parts, and uh, this uh, can. Solve the how say, can solve the problem. Uh, this kind of uh, I mean the same thing. The last example for the fuel sludge, I call it the actuator. The actuator can can be a robot to push and pull the fuel sludge to make to match each other. Uh, this kind of uh, practice is uh, you I mean use a robot 
as a tool to do in process uh, compensation control is important. If we have a flexible manufacturing system, we have different incoming parts and uh, maybe slightly different. We can use the same production line to deliver multiple final products. In this sense, is uh, I mean, is pretty good. But also, with this capability, means more investment, more maintenance. Uh, that's another aspect the company should consider. We really want it. And the next question is from Zhu Yu Huang from Hong Kong U. is, is asking about this determination or selection of system variables. And he thinks that the selection of system variables seems to vary from case to case. So he's wondering if there is any common standard to guide us on the selection of appropriate system variables. And could you take more about how and why you choose certain system variables in real life cases, as you mentioned? Uh, I think for each specific system, the specific variables could be different, but for any system, it fell in the classification in my slides. We have a performance measure, right? You have a system you care about something, that performance measure. And uh, second, you, uh, what is the system status? Uh, I mean, for any system that the good status, you have a descrip description. This system is good and not good. What are the, I mean, variables? And then how to measure this one is good and not good. So the classification I have on my slides, that one is really generic. But for a specific system, you're talking about the rolling. You have a roll gap, rollers, uh, uh, temperature, and so on. You talk about the semiconductor. They have a bunch of uh, different process variable, cost variable. That's a specific. You, you have to become a domain expert when you do the data analysis. When I say domain expert, it really means if you work on a project, a particular system, you do data analysis, but you should have no problem to communicate with uh, the engineers who work on the system. They see terminology, they see what the problem, I mean, you should understand. That's the basic requirements. Okay. Thank you. And I think the last question uh, comes from Dari, uh, Professor Derek Sigularik. So, uh, hello, uh, hi, Professor. So it's great to see the work which you have done. So. Do you see opportunities in linking deep learning with physics-based simulations in real time? And what critical challenges your evasion in approaching this problem? Derek. <laughs> uh, Derek, nice to, I didn't know you are here also. Okay, Derek, uh, this, uh, this problem is definitely yes. It's absolutely yes. I did not work on this one, but uh, you can check a uh, paper by Scott Reed S-C-O-T-T R-E-E-D. Uh, he works for uh, deep learning and uh, he lead a team work exactly those kind of uh, problems. And uh, you can go to the Google uh, S-C-O-T-T Scott Reed R-E-E-D and uh, they have a bunch of papers talking about this. And also we can talk offline uh, there. Okay, okay. And uh, actually, I also have a question about application of the sensors like on um, artificial implants, but uh, due to time limit, I may also communicate with Professor Xu offline. Uh, so uh, I th thank you for all audience. And before, and thank you Professor Xu for your very comprehensive and detailed uh, talk on the uh, machine learning enabled quality improvement, especially for in-process control. So before, uh, before I pass the time, uh, to Professor Huang the head to give a closing speech. I also uh, would like to um, have a promotion about the next seminar uh, to be delivered in April, uh, uh, given by Professor Jason Choi, and you are all welcome to join us. And also thank you, Professor uh, Mingxi and Professor uh, Fujitong to join us. Okay, so Professor Huang, may I uh, invite you to say a, for a few words to close the seminar? Thank you so much, Yao. Thank you, Professor Xi, for your enlightening uh, uh, seminar. Uh, at the time, we had almost 400 audience. I'm sure uh, we are uh, appreciating uh, your generous share of your research achievements. Okay, this uh, uh, seminar series was initiated by our young colleagues 
in the department, but uh, the speakers are top professors in the world. So we really appreciate uh, your time to give this uh, uh, seminar. Okay. Uh, we also look forward uh, to your physical visit at Hong Kong U again. Uh, I think our young colleagues are very eager to have you here as a mentor to you know, advise their career development and also potential uh, joint research in the future. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Yao, as well. Thank you. Thank you yeah. all. Thank you, Professor Huang. Thank you all, Professor Xi, again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Huang. I'm always looking forward to see you and visit you uh, university. I was there 202 for two months, and uh, I really like the university and also location. Can do lots of exercise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Xu. So I will communicate with you offline.